Okay, candidate number four, Sandy Batho. Last, but by no means least in all that jazz. Listen, if you're still here at number four, well, I guess I can't thank you enough for bearing with me. This has been an intense learning experience for me, and we've had technical problems of a multitude of different shapes and sizes throughout. But it's been a ton of fun as well. Learning about and discovering what works and what doesn't work is so important, from format to duration, just asking questions, just learning how to ask questions effectively. I really hope I've been of some help ahead of this vote on Thursday. Now, what follows is an interview, it's quite interesting, which if I had attempted to conduct it when I was in my late teens, I'd have taken a very much more hostile and adversarial approach to. And why is that? The truth is that for too many people, for too many years, the word conservative has been a pejorative, both in Scotland and across the Western world. And I think that both morally and intellectually, that's wrong. This is a state of poverty we've toppled into. By writing off a full half of the political spectrum, we're effectively amputating our own ability to gain a clearer perspective on the world which surrounds us. There is much which conservatism, not to mention its many great writers and thinkers, has to offer the modern world. And it's okay to take your politics a la carte, so long as the moral principles which underpin them remain consistent. Sandy Batho is the Conservative candidate for Edinburgh Western. I immensely enjoyed our discussion, and that discussion is what follows. I hope you enjoy it. Before we go any further, I have some, I hope, interesting ideas for future shows I'd like to release and discussions I'd like to have over the summer, including talking to an architect or two about the future of affordable housing. So I hope you can join me for that. And as always, and lastly, if you like this video, drop it a thumbs up, and if you really like it, consider finding your way to that red subscribe button also below this video. I'd really appreciate it. Okay, Sandy Batho, thank you very much for joining me today. Mm -hmm. um, you're the last candidate on the list, <laughs> last but not least. Um, you're aiming for the Conservative, Scottish Conservative Party mm -hmm. for Ember Western. Um, how's the campaigning going? And I mean, what are your motivations for running? <laughs> Well, personally, motivations for running, I live in Edinburgh Weston uh, and I would find it a great privilege to be representative here. Um, I've always been interested in politics and uh, I stood in Lanithgow and Falkirk East in the general election, which is the next door seat as it happens. So for this election, I decided that uh, I wanted to be selected to stand for Edinburgh Weston here. And um, I would um, find it extremely motivating, actually. I've uh, um, done quite a lot of work in other walks of life. Uh, I've not been a politico, as it were, for uh, many a moon. And so I would find this would be a, a great stage to, to go into professional politics. What did you do previously, Adam? Well, I'm a, uh, what we call a uh, personnel director or human resources director. I've been doing that for a number of years. I currently work for an engineering uh, services company in Glasgow. Uh, and I previously worked in companies like uh, um, SO UK in the oil and gas sector and in Royal Mail um, and the National Trust for Scotland. So other um, sort of a wide range of sectors. I've been in the financial services sector, which is relevant for Edinburgh Western uh, in addition. And I think that gives you a good insight for what to bring into politics. One of the things it seems to me that politics lacks at the minute uh, are a number of people who are elected representatives who have any uh, degree of either business experience or indeed a wider range of experience beyond um, their political environment. It used to be relatively rare in, in the past that people who had only um, been a political advisor or been involved in um, some campaign and support work in political parties would then become elected as MPs or MSPs. It is now quite regular. So I think it would be good to have somebody brought into the parliament that's got much more of a diverse range of experience. You said you worked at the Royal Mail. And, mm -hmm. I mean, how do you feel about uh, what's your insight on Royal Mail? Do you think it should have been privatised or... Uh, state nationalised because you're yeah. in a position to really no indeed when I was when I was there it was nationalised and I was head of employee relations mm -hmm. uh, at that time um, this was in the early 2000s when privatisation really wasn't on the agenda it was Labour government um, at that stage and one of the things I used to say with the trade unions there um, <clears throat> where there was a terrible incident rate of, of strikes um, and it was one of the last sort of companies and industries really that uh, saw 
thought as almost like an instinctive way in which to go about their business um, would be to walk out the door in order to get a point addressed, which was you know completely wrong in this day and age. And I often used to say with the National Trade Union, which was the Communication Workers Union, that um, <clears throat> what was important is that you know they found ways in which to address their grievances, which didn't involve just walking out of the door or, on every occasion, um, and that if you know this habit didn't change, then it would just incentivize um, within the political establishment for people to look at other options. If you had a Royal Mail under public ownership that was working well, was, which was efficient, uh, which was had a zero strike uh, record and was producing good customer service returns, then the sort of demand for privatization just wouldn't have been there. However, that's not what happened. And there were very poor uh, industrial relations. Um, I was involved in helping to calm some of those things uh, down, some of the rates of incidents, but there were a couple of national strikes. And um, at the end of it all, I think the, there was a position in which, as a business, you see this on continental Europe, uh, a lot of the postal services have been privatized because the question has sort of come up, do you really need the state to be involved in delivering mail? Yeah, that's what I, I would say. Saying that when it comes to nationalization, I, for me, it's sort of the first question is, well, is it a vital industry? Mm. And so, I mean, when you look at email, yeah, alone, I indeed. Mean, that I, well, when we raised this interview, I didn't send you a single letter. No, no, no. I'd be amazed if you did, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it'd be a lot more expensive. And I think um, the point you raise is relevant because in the past it was relevant for uh, government to assure communications were, were happening through the post office network um, and through um, having a, a delivery system in, in place. But of course, people can now um, set up their own businesses if they want. That has been uh, established through European liberalization of the postal service. It's not just a UK thing. This is happening right across Europe. And as I mentioned, a number of the former state companies in um, continental Europe have um, been privatized and uh, they are doing perfectly well. And one of the reasons why privatization does have a relevance for this is it's a better means by which to access capital and get investment in. And if you're running a logistics business, which is frankly, is all that Royal Mail is, then you need to be um, on top of your game in terms of um, where technology can take you to to allow for a more efficient delivery service. And that's really what made for a compelling argument for privatization. Yeah. I mean, and you mentioned Europe there. It's a, it's a nice segue. Mm -hmm. we could, uh, and uh, this is a conversation that's... It's, these conversations are prone mm. to go on for a long time. We could, we might <laughs> condense it, if you like, into mm. a few minutes. I mean, um, firstly, what is your position on this upcoming referendum in Europe? Right. Well, I think, first of all, I think the government, the Conservative government, is absolutely right to hold a referendum mm -hmm. because there are times in which you need to give um, the ability to the electorate to, to settle an issue. And clearly, it has become divisive. And the European Union itself is in many senses only got itself to blame because it has become a very bureaucratic institution. Um, it has not endeared itself to many citizens. This is not just a UK thing. Um, and the European project needs to reform um, and to become much more responsive to the needs of citizens and for that being much more obvious in how that is handled. Um, <clears throat> its instinct isn't like that. It was set up uh, between uh, well, it's essentially kind of French bureaucracy. Much of the model is set up upon. Um, but So I think it's right that we have a, um, a, a real once-in-a-generation referendum, because once the result of this is known, that, that, this will be it. Not like the SNP on independence, where they are uh, just looking for any opportunity to have a, another referendum yes, in order yeah, to get their way. way. Yeah, but um, so <coughs> this is uh, going to be uh, the issue that will we'll, um, sort it, and I think it's right that we, we have this opportunity to do that. In terms of where I sit in it, I have been pro-European or all my adult life um, and I think that in the same way I support the UK where there is a political union within these islands I think that it is right that there's a European Union in which we look for commonalities we see whether there are more efficient ways, such as tackling climate change, environmental issues, more commonly across Europe, rather than each country having to try and do things on its own. 
Uh, and I think that's entirely uh, a good thing to try and pursue. And the challenge, and that's really, I think, where the Prime Minister <coughs> has attempted to get the reform agenda focused, and it doesn't just stop with this referendum, it will continue, because believe you me, there are lots of other countries that are watching this referendum with, with a lot of interest. Um, <coughs> the reform agenda for the European Union continues after this, and it needs to become much more uh, responsive to, to citizens. I personally think that um, <coughs> the country... Uh, as a whole and all the four home nations within it will vote to to stay in uh, the European Union um, and if that is the case then I think it means that that issue is then settled and we are not going to it doesn't matter how close it is it is settled it's finished and then we move on in terms of uh, uh, managing our way within Europe it's kind of a it's a it's one of the necessary uh, unavoidable problems with these sort of binary questions, yes or no, because I think a lot of people who would be, uh, say, mildly Eurosceptic, as you mm -hmm. said, the, the, the skeptical of the yeah. way the European Union is mm -hmm. as it stands, uh, it has huge problems. Mm -hmm. They would worry that if they voted um, to stay, that that would be a sort of de facto mandate of people who are in favour of many of these aspects for which the mm -hmm. Greeks are not happy about, for example, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the way they deal with um, with. Uh, economics within the, yeah. within the union people are skeptical about the euro because it's just basically a giant fiat currency that's mm, yeah. <laughs> you know, really distorted the banking system i like to listen to yanis varoufakis who's of course a sort yeah. of um somewhere between friedrich hayek and Marx himself. <laughs> That's what's interesting about uh, Varoufakis. Yeah. We talk about that as well, well, I think the binary aspect is important to talk about because, <clears throat> uh, in essence, when you have a referendum, you know, on whatever the topic is, whether to have the alternative voting system, um, whether to stay in the UK, whether to stay in Europe, um, <clears throat> frankly, you need to simplify what the issues are. And you mentioned the binariness in the sense of a yes no question. <clears throat> I think this referendum on Europe is putting the binary issue in terms of the right language, in terms of remain or leave. And I think if there were to be any future Scottish independence referendum, those should be the words on the ballot paper because they better represent what's at stake. And the issue for us in Europe is acknowledging, first of all, we've been in it for 40 years and more. Um, and therefore, it's not a yes-no thing for me. It is, do you want to stay in it, remain within it, since that's where we have been for the past 45 years, or do you wish to leave? And leave is a much better word. And I would say the same should apply for any future Scottish independence referendum. The issue that's at stake is whether you wish to remain within the UK or whether you wish to leave it. And the problem with the yes, no uh, question that was put on Scottish independence is it gets sort of to an emotional angle and it moves away from a rationality of it. And the emotional piece was when you say, do you want or do you think Scotland should be independent? If there's an emotional angle which people would love to think that it could in some sense or another or there's a kind of national pride that we all have which draws you somewhat to the yes side but it's not the issue we have been in a political union for over 300 years not 45 years and there will be massive implications if we just walked away from that and therefore any future referendum should be uh, put to people um, <coughs> in that language of whether we're remaining within the UK or whether we're leaving do you feel that the prospect of a second referendum is kind of being held above the heads of many people who are going to be voting in this upcoming referendum? A bit like the sort of sword of Damocles that could drop at any moment and, you know, that sort of an attempt to steer Scotland, which already, according to the polls, is overwhelmingly going to vote to remain in Europe. Mm. So it's almost an, an unnecessary gun to the head. I mean, that's what, how it feels. In most yeah. Countries. Well, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, the SNP love to put it like this. They say uh, that, um, <clears throat> well, you know, Scotland will vote to stay in and the rest of the UK will vote to come out. Therefore, that's the grounds for a second independence referendum. No, it isn't. The nation had its opportunity to decide and there was 18 months worth and more of debate on this issue by the SNP on Scottish independence. So people couldn't have had more data. They couldn't have had more 
experts telling them what the various answers to various questions were. Uh, and they decided, and we decided by over 55% to under 45% to stay within the, the UK. And uh, that means that when there are issues that have to be addressed at a UK wide level, we vote as the UK as a whole, because we've voted to, to be a part of it. So I know the SNP loved to antagonize uh, people and to draw up the prospect of there can be a second independence referendum if um, that split goes the way in which they characterize things. However, they only choose to characterize things also in a very selective sense. What happens if Scotland votes to come out of the European Union and the rest of the UK votes to stay in? Is that a constitutional crisis as well? Well, of course it isn't. <clears throat> and when people say, ah, oh, but opinion polls tell you this, opinion polls tell you that, well, in the last general election, the opinion polls for about two or three years were entirely consistent in saying the general election result was going to result in a uh, hung parliament, and it didn't happen. And I would just like to remind people that the last time that there was actually a referendum on the European Union, <clears throat> The only parts of the UK that actually voted to come out were within Scotland. Not in England, right, yeah. not in Northern Ireland, not in Wales. And the overall result within Scotland <coughs> was the more marginal of the four uh, home nations in terms of uh, voting to, to, to stay in. And if you go around some of the coastal communities, and bear in mind I'm saying this as somebody who's going to be voting to stay in, if you go around some of the coastal communities and some of the farming communities and highland areas, you'll find <coughs> that there's a lot of scepticism uh, about Europe still. <coughs> and perhaps as a result of experience. And that's why the reform agenda is so important for the European Union. And so I don't believe <coughs> that if we all vote to uh, stay in uh, the European Union, that the rest of the continent will just breathe a sigh of relief and then believe that you can continue, as, uh, continue going as things were. This whole referendum has caused there to be much attention um, being drawn in other countries to this whole question about whether the EU as an institution is working in its most efficient fashion or not. Uh, and I think that will be a good thing to, to take that debate forward. We could jump around a little, um, mm -hmm. and because you know, I know that your time is limited, and we could talk about uh, this debate last night and this again, yeah. uh, the leaders debate last night kind of links into the independence debate, mm -hmm. also the Europe debate, yep. and I, I think I said this with uh, Tony Giuliano last week, that this, this whole election to an extent is sort of overshadowed by this looming referendum on Europe. Mm. I don't think it is. You know, Actually, I don't think it is. No, I mean, I can tell you on the doorstep, it's not come up at all. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, again, the SP love and, and to make the point or try and get people to, to believe that the proximity of the referendum uh, to the Scottish uh, election has been, I think their words were disrespectful. Well, actually, the last time we had a um, Oh, they feel they've held it too close because it yes, was, indeed, that was their position then. But on on when we had the alternative vote system, we actually held that on the same day as the the Scottish independence yes. referendum. So, I mean, I just don't buy this point that people can't get their brains around the two issues separately. Um, and I think that that is, this is not been a point of contention uh, on the doorstep at all. I've not had anybody write to me uh, about this. And I mean, it is more than six weeks away after our polling day for the Scottish elections um, and that is normally considered to be ample time for a campaign period um, uh, and so I don't think that this is causing any confusion uh, at all that I think the issues are, are quite separate and people can make up their minds on them. I mean so this leaders debate last night mm -hmm. I caught the highlights admittedly I haven't watched the entire mm -hmm. thing um, but what's your position personally on because 2010 they did the leaders debate mm -hmm. before yep. the general election if you remember that and I meant to say a few moments ago these are a second you said well, the, the polls were saying there'd be a hung parliament for the general election last year actually the polls which I thought were crazy at the time were saying there was going to be a Labour victory which when you look back on it is ridiculous <laughs> considering the damage that yeah. was in and, and I assumed that essentially the Conservatives would whether true or not would be seen to have stabilized the economy and they would be rewarded for that and you see that in electoral yeah. history going in all different yeah. countries um, and that's what exactly what happened yeah. I mean the leaders debate last night though when we had them last year and we had them during the independence referendum mm -hmm. in 14 do you think it's there's there's an element of it that, that sort of detracts from the essence of 
policy and argument and, and do you think that having that visual medium where mm. it's uh, one candidate mm. trash talking the other candidate uh, you know, mm. in a way that only politicians can <laughs> um, with varying degrees of success I mean, do you think that's a good thing we should continue to adopt a more American mm. style debate model I think in one sense it's probably now inevitable mm. um, whether regardless of what you think the relative merits of it are because once you start doing it it's very difficult to not run such a program you know going forward uh, and I think the uh issue is is that it's important that um, these programs are are run in as balanced a fashion as possible um, certainly the first leaders debate looked a wee bit unwieldy because obviously there are more fringe parties if I can call them that they probably won't like that title but there are <coughs> there are there is more diversity in political choice so the leaders debate does become quite a difficult forum if you're you know you've got six on and maybe in the future you're feeling you have to invite the seventh and the eighth party leader um i would find that would be very unwieldy um and probably wouldn't help an awful lot i think the first leaders debate which did have more people on it um was not as effective as this this latter one which was um you know slightly smaller number i don't think they're going to stop um, therefore, the, the way in which this should be managed in terms of the the media and the, the, the chairing of the debate is try to be as focused as possible on the policy issues. I was asked, is it a Hustings uh, event? I have no problem with Hustings being televised and uh, yeah. my image being uh, <laughs> further publicized. However, these tend to be little community events in which um, relatively small numbers of people uh, turn up um, to I them. I they get quite intense. Well, they can get intense. One of the questions that I was asked, we were all asked, uh, was about honesty mm. in politics and what were candidates' views about honesty. And one of the points I made was that I think what's important is that political parties need to show why they are distinctive in order that people can see they have a choice. I think where people get frustrated in politics is if everybody seems to be saying the same sort of thing and um, therefore they can't either feel they can't make up their minds or they believe that the political parties are ducking some of the issues. So I think you know that's not a very good uh, way in which to proceed. But if the way in which the dialogue um, is, is managed shows um, what is distinctive about what each party is offering, then I think it's a, it can be a very legitimate um, way in which to proceed. And I think the, the way in which the, the, the leaders debate you know, last night happened touched on some of those points. Uh, I certainly make the point and did so in my hustings that what's distinctive about the Scottish Conservatives is that we are absolutely clear that if you voted no or even if you voted yes and having doubts now and who wouldn't have doubts after seeing the oil price having crashed from $110 a barrel down to 30 or so dollars a barrel. Uh, well, I mean, that degree of volatility completely changed the SNP's economic um, you know, case for, for independence. Um, and we are very clear as a party that it doesn't do any country any good if all you do is go on and on about the constitutional issue. And that's what the SNP want to do. And we think that we're the strongest party amongst the others who are clear on that point that, um, you know, we will not be having a second independence referendum. And one penny income tax, um, we kind of the upper brackets mm. in the regular income. Uh, and I think uh, Scottish Conservatives and the SNP are both in favour of not increasing that tax, but I assume for different reasons. Um, yeah, I think the SNP, because they don't want to do anything that's controversial. And they essentially are a populist party, and they are riding on a wave of um, where they've not had much accountability, because everything that's gone well in Scotland to date, they've claimed the credit for because they've been in government, and everything that's gone badly, they've blamed the Westminster government. You know, and that is an absolutely irresponsible way in which to position things. So they're essentially just a populist movement as far as that's concerned. And our view, however, is much more principled, which is we take the view that as far as taxation is concerned, we start with the premise that it's your money. 
and that if government wants to take more of it, it needs to make a pretty good case as to why that's necessary. We actually think it's dangerous to increase taxation in the very first stage in which Holyrood gets um, devolved powers on taxation uh, and making the, uh, the northern part of the UK the most highly taxed part within these islands. We actually think that's quite dangerous. And the problem with a lot of the other parties, all of whom are proposing to raise taxes in one form or another, inclusive of the, the SNP, because they don't want to uh, make a move on the, the, the 40 pence lower um, um, taxation band by which people get drawn into that bracket. And the reason why we are moving it is because it has been frozen for some time and therefore many more people have been brought into the 40% tax bracket. There never used to be in that. So we're rectifying that profile. And we think that's the, we think that's the right thing to do. It seems as though we um, for the Scottish Parliament for a long time and not anymore now with these extra powers uh, there's an extent to which whichever governing party is there they can be a sort of backseat driver because you, you're, mm. you have some levers of control but you don't have things so people care about money yeah, you know, it's, I mean, they care about their families and a lot of yep. other things but money yep. matters to people and mm. you think that the, um, now that that card is on the table the misuse of it could cost whichever governing party has gone in this case the Scottish National mm. Party that position of being the government because yeah. you've now got you're now able to make decisions that can really annoy absolutely people. and i think that's where true accountability starts to come into play uh that's why they dodged it. well absolutely and interestingly i was just listening to the radio program on bbc scotland this morning and uh, radio scotland and it were the, one of the callers was calling in and was saying he had voted smp in recent years he voted yes in the referendum <clears throat> and he's been really horrified with seeing how the parties other parties policies on taxation um, have jumped um, at the first opportunity to um, vary taxpayers. They've, 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 they've opted to, to jack them up, not do anything, pulling them down or anything. And he's actually going to vote for the Scottish Conservatives for the first time ever. So people do care about the money and with good reason. Our concern about managing the exchequer is that it's important to know that whatever you do with rates, what you achieve is actually increased revenue as a consequence. And there is plenty of evidence from elsewhere which has shown that if you put up rates, particularly at the uh, higher bands, too far and too much, which is what the Greens want to do, which is what Labour and the Liberal Democrats want to do, and the SNP, I have no doubt, will eventually get to that point as well, you will just have people who will not either do business here or will move. And it doesn't matter what you think about those people's morals or motivations for doing that. If they go, they go. And then the exchequer loses revenue and there is plenty of evidence to show where this this happens for example in france when president hollande was first elected as socialist president a few years back um, the first thing he did was jack up the um, top rate of income tax um, in fact up to about 70 percent i think it was and surprise surprise lots of people um, were then saying, excuse me, that's my money and you are taking you know, an awful lot more of it and I object. And there were a lot of people who moved. In fact, London is now considered to be the center of half of <laughs> wealthy Paris because people have moved to London. Gerald Depardieu was a very well-known actor figure. He, he, very provocatively, he just moved literally 500 yards inside the Belgian border and bought a house and gave two fingers to the French government. So people can and will move, and there will be less revenue raised as a, as a consequence, unless the case is clear. And we could, um, on this last issue, if you'd mm -hmm. like, I mean, for, for you, uh, what is the most, uh, what is the goal here for the Scottish Conservatives? I mean, we have behind us uh, Ruth mm -hmm. Davidson for strong opposition. Yes. Is, is the sort of, to be realistic, the Scottish Conservatives know they're not going to sweep the Parliament. They'd like mm -hmm. to create an opposition for this fight, a solid opposition. Um, against the Scottish National yeah. Party for the next five years because I think I, I spoke to I don't want to name names I could be wrong <laughs> at least one of the candidates I spoke to um, said that you know well yeah the assumption is that the SNP will win but mm. this is a time where you kind of create a solid opposition and yeah. hopefully next time mm. you can really eat away at their majority yeah. I mean mm. is that the is that the goal short well I think I think they, yeah the because I think Ruth well, yes I mean Ruth has been very really clear on these points that um, um, you know if all we had in terms of our strap lines and um, slogans was, you know, Ruth Davidson for first minister. I think people probably just see that that's 
not realistic. Whereas the concept of being the most effective opposition party and leader in Holyrood is entirely realistic and is also extremely necessary. And that's why Ruth has made the point that, you know, no votes are counted yet. Obviously, some have been cast for postal votes, but um, no votes have been counted yet, so we can't presume anything, regardless of what opinion polls may uh, tell us or not, as the case may be. Uh, and anything, of course, could happen in a democracy. And after all, you know, the SNP, when it managed to sweep the board, that was against all expectations. Um, so anything can happen in politics. What's important for us, and this is what our campaign is all about, is demonstrating momentum. And the momentum is with the Scottish Conservatives in the community that voted no, the majority of Scots. And it's also with some of the people who voted yes as well, because there was a very strong, well, very large component, I would say rather, of what I would consider to be quite a soft you know, yes vote in the referendum. And <clears throat> we're appealing to those people as well, people who maybe traditionally voted Labour for many years, um, <clears throat> but see uh, that what Ruth is standing for is realistic uh, and that she's very clear on the points and they recognize that you can't just go on and on about the constitution that's what damages countries and ultimately parties at the end of the day and you need to move on and we're about moving on and providing a much more critical um, <coughs> assessment of how the SNP, if it is re-elected back into government, um, will be held to account. And that simply has not happened under Labour. Well, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, Bethel. Not at all. Thank you. <laughs>